Good afternoon. We're now going to inaugurate this discussion panel. It's difficult to follow in the footsteps of Mr. Lagos, who gave such a brilliant presentation, so we'll make a special effort to make this interesting for the audience. You know the members of the panel already. I won't introduce them again. You'll have the agenda. The panel is made up by Sergio Kaufman, the president of Accenture Argentina. He's going to present the book to us. Dr. Guadagni, who's been studying education and academics for a number of years. We have Alieto, who's a colleague of mine in the assessment department in the ministry. That's Elena Duro. I'm sorry, and Luis Benveniste from the World Bank. So the idea of the panel today is to deal with some of the issues explained in the book. And referring to what former President Lagos was saying, I was discussing this with the panelists, and I think we all agree with Ariel when he presented the challenges to be faced by education in Latin America, when he presented furthermore some of the potential solutions for these challenges. And I would like to start by asking Dr. Guadagni first and then Sergio, why is this the case? Dr. Guadagni, can you please repeat the question? I'm sorry, I was thinking of what I was going to say. Well, we got off to a, a bad start, I'd say. As I was saying, Ariel was very clear. I'll start with Sergio better first. Ariel was very clear when he presented the necessary reforms, the diagnosis, the problems. And why would you say this is the case in Latin America? Why aren't we making a faster progress? Why aren't we having deeper reforms? OK, go ahead. Because there is no political will to do so, because the higher socioeconomic levels dropped out of the public school. They sought refuge in private education and they left the public school as a battlefield between the teachers and the rest of the population. That is why there is so much lack of interest and that is why the political class is not willing to face this type of situation either. There is no political will to solve the problems. Very well, Sergio, perhaps you could give us a more business-oriented look. Sergio speaking. Okay. In personal terms, I say if there's a tool that leads to social mobility, that would be education. So it's not merely the employability and economic development goals, it's the goal of social mobility, which is what keeps the middle class alive, what keeps them trying to make progress. I went to a public school, to the public university, so in my entire life I was educated in the public sector. Then I got the chance to go to Oxford and to study abroad, but I feel indebted to the system. And as you were saying before, you asked me as a businessman, and in terms of employability and all the rest, I think perhaps what should change is that the most privileged classes and those of us who have the responsibility of leading companies, we all need to understand that somehow we are the lucky in the system. But for the system to go on running and working, we somehow need to participate constructively and not think of the company, because there are some entrepreneurs who might be too oriented to the company, but the company pays taxes, they generate jobs, and we shouldn't think it is up to the state to train people, to educate them. That is a bit short-sighted. and. I think we should see different perspectives. We all need to sit down. And I think we employ about between two and 3,000 university graduates a year. And I feel indebted to public universities because they are the ones who supply the most professionals for us. And I think we should try to understand how to constructively give jobs to those graduating. And I think there's one more challenge, and I'm going to propose this for discussion, which is the evolution of technology. A thousand or a hundred years ago, schools taught children practically stable knowledge. And I was working with my HR staff today, and I thought of what we are looking for today in prospect and employees and candidates, and we look for digital knowledge from sociologists, people who work with interactive models, artificial intelligence models, there's mathematics and sociologists who need to work on that. Then robotics, we need more robotic architects. And then sociologists, network sociologists, I mean, 
So the entire interaction model between people has changed. So wouldn't it be too much for us to ask an educational system that's conservative and that it is very hard to change, to train someone over a cycle of 10 to 15 years and to predict what companies we need, what companies will need, when companies themselves do not know what they'll need six months from now. It takes the system 15 years and we cannot know what we will need six months from now. So we need to make sure that our basic needs, reading, basic arithmetic skills, knowledge, speaking, oratory, which is not taught in many countries, at least not in Latin America. And we all need to make presentations at some point. So in any technology an employment scenario, a person should be capable to read, to present th their ideas articulately, to compare and contrast them with someone else, and to interact. Those will be the main skills, I think, which is why I'd say the future needs basic skills, where the employability will change every six months, every year, or every three years. I have a personal story related to this. I met someone who had been working on at a GPS factory about a year and a half ago. And GPS is turned obsolete within a year. So the person had been trained to do this, but technology had changed so much that what hadn't varied was the need to work as a team, to use technology as a basis. But we cannot expect the system to educate people for that specifically. Not even the most dynamic companies can do so. Thank you. Elena, you've been studying education over the past few years, and one of the main reforms or the main topics that Ariel touches upon on the book, in the book is assessment. You have been working on assessment in Argentina. And as regards what Ariel was presenting, what are the difficulties you've found in practical terms now that you're trying to implement assessment systems in the country? Elena speaking, I'd rather discuss the book with you, not the practical problems that one comes across in terms of assessment. I'm going to answer to that, but first I would like to refer to your primary question and to what Lieto, Alieto was saying. I believe there's something that former President Lagos was stating this morning at the Casa Rosada, and he was asking why Latin American educational systems are not transformed. And I think he was very bold and very brave when he said something that I agree with, absolutely, it is a bit more complex than he suggested, but I think it is already a crucial item that we must understand, and it is the idea that we have chosen a simpler path, which is the fact that we cannot have simultaneous coverage with the struggle for quality. Some of us in the educational sector thought coverage came first and quality followed. To be honest, I always found that that idea should be debated. That is what we see today, in fact, because the children that join the educational system end up dropping out if the simultaneous effort it does not strive for quality and for a substantive change from what schools offer. And undoubtedly, a policy where we allocate resources or bricks or buildings is much easier than to think strategically and deeply of the overhauling of schools or school and teacher excellency and of the relevance of information and of education. This is a comment regarding the book. I think the educational excellency chapter in the book should be closely intertwined with the relevance of information. In the book, these are separate or isolated chapters somehow, and I think the two are related. Now, in terms of assessment, I think everything included in the book in general terms reflects my own viewpoint. I would like to congratulate those who prepared the book and who invited me to participate. You have made a great effort to systematize all the knowledge available. You suggest some items for debate on which we could agree to a certain extent, but it is most necessary to discuss this. No one can disagree with quality education, but we have to work for this. I see there's journalists in the room as well, and I think Going back to what I was saying before, we need to find new allies to make greater progress. As I was reading the book, 
I asked myself a number of questions, and I have been asking this ever since I took over. And the idea is, how can we seize the efforts of resources, the investments in terms of time and resources made by the governments? How can we find standardized efforts at the, all levels? Schools do not use the information that comes out of the different ministries of education in the different countries at the national level. And I think this is related to the lack of resources at the jurisdiction level in federal states, but also because of a lack of dialogue with teachers in terms of what that education or that information is prepared for, how can it be more friendly for teachers, and how can we generate more strategic alliances through a social covenant and and mainly with the media. The journalists who are in the room are going to be invited to an international seminar in November, the, from the 8th to the 10th. The OEI is going to accompany us in this initiative, and at such event, we're going to debate this idea. How can schools use the information? What are our new allies? And I think the media is very important to do so, but also what formats do we choose in order to work with schools? Within this format, the central government needs to be accountable. They need to be at the helm in order to strengthen the initiatives of the local governments and the different assessments units at the local level. We need to train human resources in this sector because it is not taught at universities. I looked at the curricula of the different education careers in the different universities and no one has this assessment aspect in the curricula. This is where we have lagged the most. We are 20 years behind. There are no psychometrists, there are no measures, no experts in terms of assessment. So we need to make great efforts. So that is partly related to the efforts I had to make. Luis, the book speaks of the need to generate a social covenant or a social agreement. And it is somehow the politics behind the educational policies. What country has succeeded in doing so, would you say, over the past years? Could you mention any? Luis Benveniste speaking. Okay, as an autobiographical uh, context, to give you some context, I've been in the World Bank for 20 years and have specifically focused on Asia over the past 12 years and worked on the Southeast Asia region mostly. I would say the transformation that has happened in terms of education in Asia has been incredible. During the last PISA test, Vietnam was a great surprise, a great star. But what countries have made this social covenant or agreement, would you say? Well, I'm getting to that. I'd say the educational transformation in Asia has started from a social commitment of families and students with the education task. But it also corresponds to the government's initiatives to, on the one hand, prioritize the funding of education and, on the other hand, creating opportunities where teachers have become professionals. And then they have also supported schools in terms of their relationship with the community and within schools in their commitment to teachers and school principals or headmasters have also led this transformation. Schools are part of a community and this is what they have shown. This would not happen overnight, of course. We need clear standards in order to achieve such transformations and I say, I say the pillars of the committee point towards that. We need clear pillars, we need teachers training, we need assessment, we need education and I think all that information should be fed back into the school so as to transform form and customize the information and the particular needs of students. Thank you. Mr. Doctor, I saw you saying that you did not agree. Wait, he's not paying attention. I saw, Dr. Guadagni, that you disagreed with Mr. Lagos when he spoke of higher education in Argentina. Dr. Guadagni speaking, I'd say uh, Argentines in the room should understand our system is flawed in two ways. It is exclusive and 
It is poor quality. Why would I say it is exclusive or excluding? Because 75% of children who join um, first grade, or 75% of first graders are going to go to public university, and only 14 of them will finish university. So you see, the system is flawed. If you are born in a poor house, you will never finish high school. If you're born in a rich home or a middle-class home, you're going to finish high school and you'll go to university for free, and that will be paid by those who cannot go to university. What do I mean? The book says that in Argentina, 40% of people have university degrees, which is true and false at once. That is the case with averages. If I say 50% is the average between 1 plus 99, that is the average of 1 plus 99, is true, but the variations are great. In 2003, every 10,000 children who joined the first grade, only 29 finished first in high school in 2014, so out of 129 finished. And in 2003, every 100 children who started primary school in a public, in a private school, 70% finished. So you see, where we have so many students, most of the majority of students in the public university, the UBA, come from private schools. Public schools only represent, only account for one third of students in the UBA. So at the UBA, most students come from private schools, and that the only exception being philosophy and letters and literature. So you see, that's the big battle of inequality. Now, in terms of assessment, some aspects are grotesque altogether grotesque. I think national assessment systems from the Ministry of Education published in 2007 48 results. There's 24 jurisdictions in the public and private. So there were 48 assessments for first graders, third graders, and then the end of high school. They each published 48 results. In 2010, we made great breakthroughs and we finished with inequality. We no longer published 48 reports, we only published 24. So public and private schools were in the same report. Tucumán, which was one of the jurisdictions, used to have two. But now there's no more inequality. We published everything together. And we only realized this in 2013. We published five results in 2013, no longer 24 provinces. Now it was divided into regions. I hope the next results won't be just one for the entire country, you see. Of course not, of course not, Alieto. But this is not the serious matter here. I'd say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but can you name one country in the world that forbids us from publishing education results? Can you name one country that has this section 27 limiting education? Yes, Uruguay. But El País, a newspaper from Uruguay, appealed that provision. They went to the circuit court, the state appealed, they went to district court, and then it was all over. So I think the big problem is not that the law forbids us from publishing results, but the fact that no one cares. Out of all of you here, has any of you asked their school principal what the ranking of your school or how it was rated in 2013? Probably not. I don't even know if the principal has this assessment, even though he has the right to have it. But that is the problem. Our laws, we, which were made through an alliance from between the educational systems in the provinces and the unions, introduced a statement that said that the results cannot be published with the students' names, of course, but they cannot name the institutes because they don't want to be stigmatized. And children are stigmatized when the education system is poor, not when the system is poor, not when the child is poor. So what you're working on, of course, would like to address these problems by using different models. I see Gustavo Yae back there, and he knows the system. He knows the assessment methods were used in order to improve and to create regional committees or neighborhood committees with municipal authorities, for instance. So. We have a big problem in that regard. You also spoke of graduation and graduates. Well, we are a very different country here. We are the only country in the world to forbid 
admission test to join university at the end of high school. So that law was approved at the end of last year. No one is thinking of changing that, even though there are two public universities that seek to have admission tests in Rio Negro and La Matanza. What the law says is that no one can take any exams, that students should not be forced to pass an exam in order to be admitted to university. Argentines seem, this is, seem to think this is a sign of progress. So Vietnam, China, and Cuba, all communist countries have graduation exams. Why would you say revolutionary countries in Latin America, such as Nicaragua and Ecuador, have exams to graduate from high school? That is part of the constitution in Ecuador. Mr. Correa has enshrined it in the constitution. And then in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Brazil, they also have exams for students to graduate from high school and to be admitted to university. You'd say that's restrictive, but there's nothing more restrictive than not stimulating studies. In Latin America, we're the country with the most university students, but we are the ones with the least graduates. In Chile, they have 80,000 graduates with half the students we have, half the inhabitants we have. We have less graduates than Chile, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. These are the three countries in terms of assessment have, besides, done a lot that we wouldn't even think of today. I have 13 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. They always ask a question that I cannot answer. They say, hey, Grandpa, I'm going to go to university. I want to study economics. Where should I study? And to be honest, I don't know. I don't know what the best school of economics is or what the best school is for engineering. But in Colombia, in Mexico, and in Brazil, they do know which one is the best, because all graduates from all careers, when they graduate, they have to sit for an exam, which doesn't mean they will not graduate if they fail it. That is secret. The results are only published by school, by university. So it is known that 70% of this university got this score. And whether universities are public or private, those who are in the left of the distribution column always lose. No one thinks of having such a type of assessment in Argentina. So if we speak of assessment, I think we should not look at the U.S. and Europe. We should think of what has been done in the rest of Latin America, and we're very far behind. Elena, Elena speaking. Yes, I'm forced to tell you what the ministry is going to do in terms of assessment. I'm going to start with the end, and we're going to upload the database of the Aprender program, which is the greatest assessment so far, 1,400,000 children. We have 39,000 schools participating and in first, third, and sixth grade. The samples are representative. They show great cities, big urban centers, and rural areas five months into the beginning of the Aprender operation we're going to start publishing the information we've already got 24 assessment units in the different provinces in Argentina we have signed commitments with the federal education office we have different alliances strategic alliances with national and international institutions that are providing technical support assistance and different types of endorsement and the level of qualified human resources for technical aspects. We're going to publish not only the information transparently, we're also going to prepare information at the level of municipalities, not only at the province level, but also at the level of districts. So, Alieto, you see, we're working, and we're also, they're all both speaking at once. Section 97. This is something you mentioned before. This will not be on the agenda for this year, but regarding Section 97, this morning Minister Bullrich announced at Casa Rosada that we're going to be debating a law to create an institute that will assess the quality of education in Argentina, and it is going to be discussed in the House. The, the future of Section 97 will be discussed in the House. You want it changed, but I agree with the book's view 
de que tenemos that que sumar las evaluaciones to join international assessments and we need to strengthen our local capabilities in terms of assessment but there's also different risks to be considered and I think we should also debate this in Latin America that is to say how much international and how much national assessment should we make how could we strike a balance between both in Latin America some agencies have diminished their efforts because they saw that they were constantly assessing people and they didn't know what for this costs a lot of money for countries it involves much effort for schools and this ultimately is detrimental to schools I've been with UNICEF for 19 years and I know the educational systems in Latin America schools often wondered why they had 16 yearly assessments if they didn't even get enough assistance they didn't get the aid they needed so it is not only a political risk to not be independent in terms of assessment but there's also the risk that we might have an assessment as a trading bond and I think we should be prudent in that we should be cautious the international assessment system is a key piece that said LESI, the ODS which are SDGs in English sustainable development goals stating education as one of the goals I think is a key aspect and that should be on oral agendas we should monitor that and I'd say that transforms our priorities Alieto education is a priority for us bear with us be patient give us a few months to show you that we're going to be transparent with our education and other than that I would also like to let you know that this year we'll also be assessing new skills in Argentina for the first time exactly I would like to ask Sergio a question and then I would like to give the floor to the rest of the audience to see if they are interested in debating this Sergio Ariel was mentioning different surveys and studies that show that in Latin America the productive sectors has ha, sector has a hard time finding these skills as you were saying at first my question is whether you think this is the case in Argentina if you find it hard to find people with the skills and the capabilities you're looking for to work in this century and you were also saying you had between 35 and 100 university graduates and 4,000 you've also got people from the university sector and I'd say you work with post high school education or higher education what would you say you asked whether there's enough people yes any big corporation working with knowledge today knows that success or failure depends on talent it's not published everywhere but that is the case on an everyday basis that is most visible in the fringes in the borders of knowledge we have engineers experts in cybersecurity experts in the digital world that is all worth it what well, the market says it's worth because we don't have enough people with those skills so it is unfair to say that a country will not succeed because it lacks those types of professionals because because we could not have foreseen the need for that we do see a lack of engineers of data engineers of mathematicians of hard scientists of all these careers that are now more appealing or sexier than they were a few years ago so that is a matter of concern to us because much of the technological industrial progress from digital manufacturing to the world of knowledge knowledge is going to bore down to that and countries are going to develop their knowledge further thanks to that that is a concern to us but it is a matter of occupation and in your report one of the most interesting points to me was the matter of social agreements people spend more in order to not feel guilty but I think aspirations are no longer thought of as related to knowledge knowledge no longer has the position it used to have in society my grandfather had not even finished primary school but he was desperate for his children to go to university knowledge used to be part of the main aspirations of our society and I think we've lost ground 
in that regard, specifically in Argentina. And I think that is a serious problem because you not only have to pay to get education, you also have to make an effort. You have to leave many of the pleasures of adolescence for later in order to get education. So our aspirations are related to education, but they are also fundamental for the educational process. There's also profiles that are easier to find and that have more future. All things related to the humanitarian or the liberal arts are more related to what we'll need in the future. I mean, there's going to be more jobs for nurses and doctors with the increase in our lives, in, in, in how long we live, are going to have more work to do. Then social networks and social media also imply an empathy with sociologists and psychologists. So we do see that we are imbalanced in that regard. We need to emphasize on harder sciences and on education. Very briefly, please. Yeah, very briefly. Late last figure, in 2013, 118,000 graduates from universities, 45 from forestry engineers, only 500 electrical engineers, social sciences, 40,000. We do not have graduates from scientific and technological years, only five hydraulic engineers in a country with the largest rivers in the world, like Paraná, Uruguay, with the Andean basins. Everybody speaks of a vaca muerta, but only 45 petroleum engineers graduated. We have our university students that are anchored in the 19th century, not in the 21st century. So, um, Luis, apparently what this aspirational thing that Sergio mentioned is observed in Asia. Apparently, their education and knowledge is something socially attractive. Yeah, and the challenge of educational systems today is that we are educating children for a labor world. We have no idea what it's going to be like. The labor world is developing so rapidly that the kind of basic competencies needed and the capabilities of children today to transform throughout their career in the future, that will be key. So it's impossible to adopt solid cognitive skills as a basis added to specific technical capabilities according to the development of the economies and being able to adopt social and emotional skills that will allow for uh, more facilities to work in a team, to absorb and analyze data, etc. Those will be key for education to really meet the demands of future generations. Is there any question? Can you identify yourself, what institution you are representing, etc.? Maria Alexandra from Pearson. I have a comment and a question. I don't agree with you, Sergio. I don't think there's a single poor family in any country in Latin America that has no aspirations of knowledge. The problem is that many of the students that join universities go to low quality universities and they cannot find a job afterwards. I don't think it's an aspirational thing. I come from a poor family and as many poor families, we all want to study. So the problem is not the desire to study engineering or whatever. The problem is the system's failure. And my question is, as to education in Latin America, what is the role of the private sector? Because we're speaking of innovation, technology, and I think that neither the public or the academic sector in many cases have the capability to create and innovate so as to generate solutions for these topics we are discussing today. Sergio, well, first, very briefly, I mean, this is... Uh, we can talk hours about the aspirational thing. It's not an issue of classes. I see middle and high class uh, children that have no aspiration for knowledge. Perhaps uh, the poorest see it as a way of social mobility. The problem is well, when those in the top don't see it. Because even society we live in, at least here, rewards things that are not associated to effort and knowledge. That is my concern. What should companies do? I think they should come out of their box. This scheme of saying, I pay my taxes, I generate jobs, then let others worry about it. In a world where the necessary knowledge for companies and in general to make progress evolves every six months, not even every year, 
so that luxury of distance is, we cannot afford that. And that is part of the ecosystem of corporations. There have been business executives that have been very close uh, solving their companies inwards, but we have started looking outwards. And part of the construction is that that the government should not see corporations just going after profit, because I think that many corporations want the system to be better. It's not good if you're a little better or if you make more money, if that is just used to build another line of bricks in your house. I mean, that is the vision that helps. And not having um, any concerns as to being able to express and listen to what the others need. Yeah, this is related to your question. How do we move from a traditional humanistic paradigm to a paradigm of teaching and capabilities and competencies, where the content is basic because the capability is not in the air? And one of the challenges of the private sector and the public schools is not only no how we train the teachers no, no and we don't, don't have time no to deal about the problem de las of the teacher training, training, training institutes, which is a very serious problem in Argentina. For those of you that are not from Argentina, we have 1,500 teacher training institutes. Imagine if the problem is not serious. It's impossible to monitor their quality. They are created out of needs that are not related to demand, for instance. But going back to the topic, we shouldn't, I mean, we should start thinking of a school with a training that is much wider and with new profiles that have been included, that have to be invited to work with the school on basic issues related to these expanded competencies. Argentine teachers know very little about the labor competencies that are needed, perhaps even in their communities. And we can see that in the technical schools themselves, because we might think that they are they have the installed capabilities, but that isn't the case. And of course, teachers in secondary schools, not all, because it's not the same in all circumstances. But in general, they have not been trained for that. They don't read the newspapers. We cannot speak freely about productive development or economic development and the link with education. And I think that has to be back in the agenda. And the private sector plays a key role. How do they have this dialogue with the school? Because it's not just pushing their way in the school or saying, this is my part or this is your part. How do we think of classrooms? How, we, how do we take education out of the classroom but also improve in the classroom at the same time? So expand the education by improving the school and expanding it to other sectors. That is one of the essential issues for the education of the future. You mentioned something very important, that is the idea of equity, inclusion, that is clearly a challenge at the university level. I admire Uruguay. I think that they are a wise people. I will ask any of you to take the book of books and go to Montevideo and see how the Uruguayan system works. 18% of graduates from the university graduated with a monthly scholarship of $280 per month. Who put the money for that? The poor that are not going to university? No, all university graduates that, since they are five, first it was for 25 years, now 30 years, they have to pay. How much? A lot? No, 100, 120 dollars per year. That is wisdom. That is intergenerational, interclass wisdom. I would like some member of Congress or some senator in Argentina to think of a funding method that is quite similar to what they have in Uruguay. Of course, there are alternative methods, such as what President Lagos mentioned very uh, sensibly. We should distinguish between those that can afford it, those that can't, and those that need the scholarship. In countries like Argentina, that is not politically feasible, but it should, what should be feasible is a model like the Uruguayan model, this university fund. Another question or comment? Any criticism? Gustavo, any comment? Sergio? Sergio. 
Speaking of public versus private, what I see, speaking of the companies, is that there are many private institutions that come and ask what's coming, but not many public institutions come to us. And going back to the bias of those that have more, as long as the private institutions are more proactive in obtaining information and adjusting to what's coming, the bias will be deeper, and to the extent that public institutions that should defend those with lower possibilities are not proactive and even reluctant to listen because it, um, sometimes it seems like they are reluctant to approach a private company, so they will be left behind. The ability to reinvent themselves private institutions, not only because they have more money, because they are more open, generates this risk of even increasing the gap. So I would take note of that risk. I had a question for Luis, but Luis wanted to say something. Going back to the first question about why many of the recommendations from the committee have not been implemented, and it has to do with an internal and an external line. Many things have been implemented. Many reform projects throughout Latin America have been implemented, but those reforms have not been successful, and part of the reason for that is that they have been reforms in the teacher career or in the administration of the student assessments, but there has been no internal alignment in the system with clear goals as to how the system itself should work together, jointly, in harmony, so as to be successful and achieve the desired results. And at the same time, an outward approach, looking at societies and the needs of the different social groups and the different needs of economic groups, so, as, so that the school can be relevant so as to support social and economic development. There's a key issue in all this. We Argentinians have two characteristics. Our laws are very good, but then we don't abide by them. So we have the shortest school year of the world. Although the law is wonderful, our law says that the school year should have 180, 190 days. But